Hey guys, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks. And boy, have I got something exciting for you here today. This is the brand new Tier 8 American Premium Medium Tank, the M46 Korea. This tank combines the hull of an M46 pattern with the stock turret of an M46 pattern, the 90mm gun that you are used to seeing on the M26 Pershing and also get a very fearsome Tiger camo job. If, like me, you love the M26 Pershing for its well-rounded nature at Tier 8 and didn't like the Super Pershing at all because it's just too sluggish, then look no further than the M46 Korea. It comes very close to being as good as the M26 Pershing, but comes in a tidy premium package that will make you loads of credits and also a huge amount of crew experience at the same time. Stay tuned, I've got multiple Ace Tanker gameplay coming right up, and if you have no interest in picking up one of these vehicles, then I'll let you know what to watch out for when they appear on the battlefield today as the final release in the World of Tanks calendar. So the M46 Patton Korea, the first M46 tanks that landed in Korea, belonged to the 6th Medium Tank Battalion. The vehicles, known as Ripper Pattons, were later allocated to the 8th Army and used by infantry forces as support vehicles. However, in 1950 and 1951, the M46 also saw action in several tank battles. By June 1951, the front line had stabilized and the mobile stage of combat had finished. And so the army started to use the vehicles in an artillery role. Along with other US tanks that fought in Korea, M46 vehicles were painted with the tiger face markings. Here's one I was lucky enough to see myself at the Tank Museum in Bovington in the United Kingdom. Such roar, such fierce. And while this Christmas garage does look pretty, it pretty much washes out all of the fantastic camouflage that you saw just a minute ago in-game on El Halouf. While I was playing this tank, a hell of a lot of people stopped alongside to take a look at the camo. You do feel very special with this paint job. And this ripper pattern is only really matched by the aesthetics that you get in Xbox World of Tanks. But looks aside, what is this vehicle and how does it perform in game? That's probably what you really care about. Well, the vehicle is basically an M46 pattern with a stock turret. As we can see here, the models are identical when I switch between the vehicles. Of course, the M46 pattern at Tier 9 does have the opportunity to use an upgraded T119 turret on which it can use a 105mm gun. However, having that gun and this turret on the Ripper pattern at Tier 8 would be completely unbalanced, and so that's why it gets the stock turret, which behaves in a similar way to the Pershing. And for all intents and purposes, you should consider that the gameplay that you're going to get in the Ripper pattern is going to be very similar to that in a standard M26 Pershing that's fully upgraded. So let's use Tanks GG to compare the Ripper pattern to the M26 Pershing, the T26 E4 Super Pershing, and the Tier 9 M46 pattern that is using a stock turret and the top 90mm gun. So the Ripper pattern has slightly better DPM than the Pershing and the Super Pershing, but it's almost completely negligible. And the fact that it's the same as the Pershing and the Super Pershing is not a good thing. Look how the DPM of the Ripper pattern compares to, for example, the Panther 88, the AMX CDC, and the SDA2. It is by far the worst with 200 to 300 less DPM, which is 10 to 15% and can make a big difference as to the amount of damage you can get out quickly in a game. However, the Ripper pattern does get 192 millimeters of penetration, which is far better than the unbuffed Super Pershing, and just a touch better than the recently improved M26 Pershing's penetration of 190. One thing that's disappointing on the tank is the shell velocity is very low, 853 meters a second. And that's something that you're going to have to watch out for in this tank is that you do have to give just a little bit more lead to your targets. The Ripper pattern has the worst aim time, with an aim time of 2.5 seconds rather than 2.3 seconds that the Pershing and the Super Pershing get. The vehicle also has slightly worse accuracy than the standard Pershing, but the same accuracy as the Super Pershing. And this accuracy doesn't really come close to, for example, the Panther 88, the AMX CDC, and is even slightly worse than the SDA too. However, this tank does get quite nice dispersion values, both when moving and turning the turret, which is better than the standard Pershing and much better than the Super Pershing which kind of balances out the disparity of 0.2 seconds in their aim time. The Ripper pattern has the same top speed limit as the Pershing and the M46 pattern at tier 9, 
which is 8 kilometers better than the Super Pershing. It also gets a nice 810 horsepower engine, which gives it a better power to weight ratio than the standard Pershing and nearly double of the Super Pershing. This advantage will be evened out by the fact that this vehicle gets worse terrain resistances than the Super Pershing and much worse than the regular Pershing. And so the Ripper pattern has very similar mobility to the standard Pershing, which isn't half bad, but it's not great either. The turret traverse on the tank is the same as the regular Pershing, but much better than Super Pershing. And the same thing can be said about the tank traverse. While on paper, the hull armor on all these vehicles looks to be identical. Remember that this Super Pershing gets that kind of riot shield in front of the hull. And that big fat wedge of space armor that you can see here is something that the Ripper pattern certainly does not get. And the same thing can be said about the turret armor. The Super Pershing gets this nice shield on the front of the vehicle that the Ripper pattern doesn't have, as we can see here. So how does the Ripper pattern's turret armor compare to that of the M26 Pershing? Well, it's actually significantly worse. As we can see here, over the mantlet, it's only 114 millimeters of effective armor, whereas the same area on the Pershing is 200. The Pershing's turret is actually remarkably resilient, and as long as they hit this mantlet area, you've got 300 millimeters of protection over most of the face of the tank. However, on the Ripper pattern, some of those areas still have 300 millimeters, but it just seems to have this gigantic hole behind the mantlet here. And so if you're engaging one of the brand new Ripper patterns, feel free to just shoot it smack in the face and you're likely to be able to go through it even with a tier six tank. And if you get lucky enough to also see the hull armor on the Ripper pattern, then just take advantage of it. The lower plate is a paltry 76 millimeters and the upper plate is 101 millimeters thick. And the side armor of the vehicle is very weak at the back, 50 millimeters in thickness and 76 at the side. And so that means even if the Ripper pattern angles his armor exceedingly well, Pretty much every tank is going to be able to go through the front of this vehicle reliably unless you hit it at some horrendous angle. And if you want to be extra sure of a penetrating shot, then you can even shoot it in this machine gun port here that is the same thickness as the lower plate and exceedingly flat. So if you're a ripper pattern driver, you can't really depend on your turret like you can on the M26 Pershing, which is a real shame because both of these vehicles get an exceedingly good 10 degrees of gun depression, which allows you to go hull down in many positions. Finally, a passing mention should be made that the vehicle gets 10 meters less view range than the M26 Pershing. And so really what we found is that the Ripper pattern is very similar to an M26 Pershing. When you take into account the hidden statistics that Wargaming have, the ground resistances and the dispersion values, that makes the mobility and the gun performance of these tanks very similar. And the only key difference is the fact that the Ripper pattern gets much less armor directly over the mantlet on the turret. Oh, and also I just noticed that the pre premium ammunition on the Ripper pattern is quite a lot worse than that on the standard Pershing, which is phenomenal. The standard Pershing gets 268 millimeters of penetration with its APCR rounds, while the Ripper gets 243. And I expect that 25 millimeters of penetration that you lose will be quite painful if you get into a bad matchup and you need to deal with some tier 10 vehicles. And that's right, the Ripper pattern does not get preferential matchmaking, unlike the Super Pershing. But hey, if I get to play a tank that is 95% as good as a Pershing, a vehicle that can do anything in World of Tanks while still making a huge amount of credits and experience, I think things are going to go pretty well for this tank. But I think that's quite enough theory crafting. Let's see how it performs in some gameplay. So here we go, I'm assaulting on Corellia in quite a nice matchup indeed. A third of the enemy team at tier 8, a third tier 7, a third propping up the bottom at tier 6. Now, when I'm attacking on Corellia, I like to be aggressive in any tank that has a reasonable amount of mobility. And the Ripper pattern certainly does. So I'm going to try and get my way to D4 and along the way spot as many tanks as I can and maybe take a few pop shots. But unfortunately, as we're going to see momentarily, I get spotted super early. Something must be rushing straight towards me. The Cromwell. Surely it wasn't the Cromwell that spotted me. Maybe he did. We're getting engaged upon from everywhere all over the map. We stopped to take a quick punt at the VK, unable to hit his hull armor and only hitting his tracks. And now there's an M41 Walker Bulldog trying to take some punts at me. He's already put one round into my tank, but one bounce. His second goes in, and now I make some adjustments in my hull armor. Now he bounces one, he bounces two, and we return fire, putting a second round into him. Can we hit him with our third? Yes, we can. He actually bounced three rounds off our tank when we angled it like this. And just check out this Tiger camouflage on front of the vehicle. Well, you can't really call it camouflage. It's more of a paint job, right? 
This is going to definitely be one of the reasons why a lot of people pick this tank up, I think. It truly is a novelty. I don't think it looks too out of place in World of Tanks. And that Walker Bulldog went through us again on the move twice. Oh gosh, he is kicking our butt with that 76mm auto-loading magazine. But, considering he's there now, I think he's run out of rounds. So I decide to take my chance in advance. Unfortunately, we missed the Nazhorn. We're not having very good luck with our on-the-move firing or even our accuracy so far this game. But finally, we put one into the VK-2801. One thing I noticed right now is that when I pressed my large repair kit, I actually misclicked, and I think I pressed my 2 key as well. I did not know I was firing premium ammunition at this moment. But let's not worry about that, because the M25 is engaging us from behind, and he, he's relentless. I kind of want to go out to be able to get shots and start getting some more spots for my team, but every time I move out, I either get spotted by someone, and that little bugger of an MT-25 keeps pestering us. Well played to him, he's keeping me locked down and stopping me from getting around the corner to where I want to go. Well, at least that one didn't miss, as we put a shot right into the side of that Tier 6 German heavy tank, and we spot him, so our team take him out. Now that we're no longer going to be spotted by that Tier 6 German heavy tank, we should be able to advance around the corner and get to where I really wanted to go. And that was up here. From here, I've got lovely cover to my left, lovely cover to my right, and I get to go hold down, hopefully against opponents that are, that are still sitting in their base at the beginning. There's the Nazhorn. Take him out quickly and it, we just get spotted. Looks like when we fire, we get spotted. Now I make my way up and I take a punt at this IS-3. The shell goes right in. And then I think now this is where I realize, what have I been doing? I've been firing APCR rounds this whole time. A complete waste of APCR rounds here. I don't really think that I would have not penetrated any of the tanks that I fired at if I was using standard ammunition rather than APCR. My fat fingers there really not doing me any favors, hey guys? So the SU-12244 appears and we try and sneak through a shot onto him. We've been reduced in our hit points enough so that we've got it. We, we're pretty much a one shot for any remaining tank apart from that MT-25. My team has managed to take the northeast though and they're starting to flank around. That's great. And talk about MT-25. As I put one into the SU-12244, the MT-25 appears. I bounce two of his shots and I go hull down on this VK. Usually I wouldn't do that on my allies, but I, I was in a bit of a tricky situation. It looks like the MT-25 had no interest in shooting that fellow. Finally, we put one into that cheeky, cheeky, cheeky tier 6 Soviet light tank. And there's an SU-12244 coming down on the left. He just finished off the VK-2801 and I rush around. And that is why this position is so strong. Time and time again, tanks continuously try and YOLO down the slope towards me. And they get shut down by people on the ridgeline. Can we hit this MT-25? Oh, really bad shot there. My marksmanship has, has not been that impressive this game. But after playing this tank for about four or five games, I have to admit, it, it doesn't feel super impressive with the aim time. And the accuracy. I've been playing a lot of other tier 8 premium medium tanks. For example, the AMX CDC or even the STA2. And all of those vehicles make this feel like it's got a, a rather underperforming 90mm. And when you take into account that this vehicle gets 192mm of penetration compared to the, I think, 212 that the AMX CDC gets, it does feel a little underwhelming at times. Our shell goes far to the left there and we're unable to put around into the side of that Super Pershing. That would have been a good one, right? The Ripper pattern finishing off its, uh, its kind of rival, I guess, the Super Pershing. So we're trying to find a shot on the T-28 HTC and now I have preloaded an APCR round. Because that is a very heavily armoured tank. I was a one shot, he was a one shot, wanted to secure the kill into him. And... That about wraps this game up. My team go on to be able to find the FB-207, take him down. Shame for him, he has three kills in this round. But I'm happy to have a fairly solid result here in my first ever game in the Ripper pattern.
So when you're playing a tank that is 95% of an M26 Pershing, which is considered probably one of the most well-rounded vehicles in the game and a jack of all trades, it's unsurprising when you can do pretty much everything fairly well, but also nothing amazingly. Before we check out the post-game stats, let's get stuck into some more gameplay. So now we're playing on Serene Coast and the matchup hasn't been quite so favorable for us, but that shouldn't be too much of an issue. I know I keep saying this, but this tank is so well-rounded just like the M26 Pershing. And the M26 Pershing was the first ever tank that I managed to get over a thousand average experience in, over about a hundred plus games. I truly loved that tank. It taught me a lot about being flexible, adapting to the situation. And so that's why I've also been quite enjoying playing this, this Ripper pattern. You, you're pretty much getting the same thing. And the only thing that disappoints me about this tank is that when I go hull down, I just can't be quite as reliable. Also, you know, maybe I'd like a little bit of better accuracy. Maybe a little bit better aim time as well. Oh, we can only wish, hey? But then, if we did have that, then this might as well just be the, the regular Pershing, right? And you wouldn't be able to get the huge amount of credits and experience that we're going to see later on in the post-game stats, which is the reason why you play a premium tank after all. There aren't really premium vehicles in the game that are better than their counterparts, apart from maybe the ISU122S that I talked about in a couple of videos ago. Premium tanks are meant to be slightly worse. And it's only the ones with preferential matchmaking that are usually dramatically worse for their tier. And a vehicle like this that doesn't get preferential matchmaking, it has to come pretty close to, to the standard vehicle. A lot like what we saw with the recent IS-3A. So get a feel for the mobility of the M46 as we get into position. And put a nice little shot down there on that tier 7 American light tank. This time not the Walker Bulldog. We track the T-54 in place. Does he put a round into us? No, he doesn't. Great result. And I spot a T-30. Nice shot there on the move. Finally, the Ripper pattern starting to get a little bit of luck with the chancy shots that I'm taking. I put one in and I actually managed to shoot past his left track and hit the right track. And this is something that you just couldn't do in a Super Pershing. If I was in a Super Pershing, this T-30 would probably look at me as a big, juicy, tasty snack. But I'm not a big, hulking, slow vehicle that has a riot shield on front of it. Now I'm a, a highly mobile medium tank that can make even turreted tank destroyers like this, played by reasonably experienced and skilled players, to make them look rather silly. Oh, Mr. ST1, look, I'm having fun here with my T-30 friend. Do you think he could go do something else for a little while while I finish this guy off? Oh, gosh, this is getting awkward. Please roll high. Yes, 241 damage done there. Thank goodness, otherwise I was going to have to take a big, meaty shot, and you don't want to get hit by the 155mm gun. So we put one into the back of the ST1. I think I would have done better to shoot the back of the turret there at that angle, but I won't make the same mistake twice. This time I get completely up behind him and start to punish his tank. Luckily for me, the ST1 does the right thing and decides to shoot the AMX instead. And I notice that I can't get around the ST1. And now he decides that he wants to aim at the Panther to finish him off. Does he not see me as a threat? This is amazing. Well, okay, I'll take a hit from you. That's no problem, buddy. And I think these APCR rounds that I'm firing here are kind of unnecessary. Actually, in the end, he angled his armor very well, and I think the APCR round was very necessary. If I hadn't loaded it, I would have probably got myself into quite a sticky situation. The ST1 armor, you know, is pretty darn thick, especially at the side. Trying to get through that with 192 millimeters of AP is not going to do you very well. Respect to the Yag Tiger on my team, who resets the cap and gives us enough time to be able to, to go and have some fun, right? Thanks for that one. Get to test out this tank a little bit further. We've already done 2,870 damage, picked up three kills. A lot of that against tanks which are higher tier than me. This is just the M26 Pershing in a nutshell, and I appreciate it. It's not called the M26 Pershing, but it almost might as well. <laughs> it might as well should be. So we put a shot into the KB-5 droid, then we come out, he returns fire, putting in a good 107mm shell into us, and the AMX-30 on my team finishes him off. 
Now, when I went forwards there, I actually got spotted by the T10. Sixth Sense tells me that. That's something that I've got to watch out for. And I bet he's coming right towards me. There he is. Oh, gosh. This isn't good. Fair enough. Maybe this is one too many tier 9 tanks that I've, I've taken a fight with that I shouldn't have. We put one shot into him, and now we load some APCR rounds. Going to need them to get through the front of his tank. And, oh, disaster. He shuts us down. I guess that was a bridge too far with regards to picking on tanks that are higher tier than us in a vehicle that is unexceptional in any regard, but has no other overwhelming weaknesses. And so my beautiful ripper pattern with the tiger motif goes up in a blazing inferno. What a shame at the end of the game, but I can't feel too bad because we had a great result, as we're going to see in the post-game stats for both of these replays. So a great result in the first round on Corellia. This was our ace tanker in our first game in the ripper pattern. We got a steel war medal this game, would you believe it, for the 900 damage that we blocked and 21 hits that we received, albeit they were from tier 6 and tier 7 light tanks with quite low caliber guns. We also got a patrol duty this game, which is a combination of a skilled crew, aggressive positioning, and also the coated optics that I like on this vehicle, which netted us 3,500 spotting damage. When we combine this with the paltry amount of regular damage we did of 2,500. That gives us a really nice base experience of 1,366. Funnily enough, this game I actually forgot to have a premium account, but we still made 43,000 credits profit even though I unknowingly was firing some of those APCR rounds due to my fat fingers. However, if we had been using a premium account, we would have made 85,000 credits profit that round, even with the APCR usage, and that would have been 4,303 experience for our double, which is a nice amount of crew training. The second game, we did a hell of a lot less spotting and a hell of a lot more shooting, this time picking up 3,602 damage, usually on higher tiered vehicles. Our accuracy was much better. We fired 22, hit 21 of those, and 16 penetrated. However, our armor didn't hold up as well. Five hits received, five penetrations, and dead. This game was also a rather meaty 1,355 base experience points, which would have been an ace tanker as well, and we made a large amount of credits, 114,000. Take away the repair and the ammunition cost, a cool 87,000 credits profit, and 2,236 experience to go into crew training or to convert off and use on other vehicles. And considering that both of these rounds were just over six minutes long, it really shows that the Ripper pattern has a very decent economy, and you don't have to do that much to still be rewarded heavily. There's no doubt that if I was playing in an M26 Pershing, I would have been able to do exactly the same, if not better, than I did in the Ripper pattern. However, there's no way I could have done this in the M26 Super Pershing which certainly plays more like a heavy tank with the spaced armor that the vehicle has on the front. But the thing is about the Super Pershing is I don't really want that armor that is so easy to bypass by just shooting above the mantlet and going through the cupola as if it was a regular Pershing. But now I've got all this extra armor on the front of my tank, which gives me worse gun handling and catastrophically worse mobility, which makes the tank just unexciting for me to play and quite often feeling frustrated that I don't have the flexibility to carry the game. Now, fair enough, the Ripper pattern doesn't have the same armor as the Super Pershing and it doesn't have the preferential match making, but I feel the fact that the gun feels just a little bit better and the mobility is leaps ahead makes this far more enjoyable for me. And the first true, at least with regards to playstyle, high tier American premium medium tank in the game. Your next question might be is how does the Ripper pattern hold up compared to all of the other tier 8 premium medium tanks? Well I feel personally that the STA2 might be in a slightly better position than this tank. And I think also that the CDC, with its enhanced mobility and massively better gun, albeit no armor at all, is probably going to do much better than a Ripper pattern would do, at least in a bad matchup where the armor doesn't really matter anyway. And I don't think that this vehicle can be compared to the T-54 first prototype because that's kind of like a heavy medium that really relies on that. 200 millimeters of effective frontal armor that the tank gets and has significantly worse mobility and gun performance than the Ripper pattern. And so finally, I guess it comes down to, is this tank worth it? 
Well, if you've already got tier 8 premium tanks, probably not. It doesn't really do anything special. However, if you're a tank collector, it's probably worthwhile picking one of these things up. They might be exceedingly rare. And I guess the final group of players that will be interested in this tank are those that just love American medium tanks, and I know exactly how you feel. I fell in love with the Pershing when I first played it, and I was absolutely gutted when I saw that they made the Super Pershing more of a heavy tank than a medium. And so I warmly welcome the Ripper pattern into the game as the first true high tier American premium medium tank that is available for everyone. And if you don't like premium tanks at all, you don't have anything to worry about because this vehicle isn't as good as a standard Pershing and really isn't going to have huge gameplay implications. And so hopefully you guys enjoyed this tank review. If you did, or maybe it was just useful to you, please consider giving the video a like down below. It really helps the channel out. And let me know in the comments down below what you guys think about the Ripper pattern. Is it an unnecessary vehicle in World of Tanks? Or do you, like me, think it's finally the true American premium medium that a lot of us have been waiting for? And finally, if you're watching this video on the release day, it's Christmas Eve, and I hope you have a marvelous time, whatever you get up to with your friends and family this holiday season season. I'm going to keep releasing YouTube videos, but I'm not going to stream until the 27th of December. And so hopefully I'll see all of you guys there. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.